Oh, was I muted? I did mute myself. Let me start that again. Can you all hear me now? Give me a heads up. All right, let's start it off one more time. Good evening. Welcome to Evening in the Stacks across Africa. We are thrilled to have so many of you join us for tonight's virtual author panel. This is the first of a two-part event that continues Saturday, May 14th, and we hope that you will join us on Saturday as well. This event raises funds for Howard County's library system, specifically the creation of a welcoming and inviting space for teens in all of Howard County library branches. And here to tell us a little bit more about this, we welcome now Tonya Aiken. She is the president and CEO of Howard County Library System. How are you? I'm well, wonderful to see you, Elsa. You're doing better than me already with your mic unmuted. So I love that. <laughs> and I love that. I love what the Howard County Library System is doing with these teen spaces. Tell me a little bit more about why this is so important for the community. Yeah, thank you so very much for this. You know, teens are not only our future, they're our present with very present needs. Um, we're committed here at Howard County Library System to placemaking for teens. We know that like the rest of us, teens were faced with unprecedented isolation for over two years. And without this initiative, they're going to emerge from the pandemic still with no place to gather that is all their own. So our HCLS teen spaces are envisioned to be the premier space for teens in grades six through 12 here in Howard County. These reimagined spaces are going to emphasize teen empowerment, interest-driven learning, mental wellness, digital and tech fluency, and social identity. Um, HCLS teen spaces are going to be the only free public space in Howard County informed by teens for teens, a place where teens can hang out and collaborate and create and discover through open-ended exploration of our collections, our software, and our materials. I mean, it really is amazing. And we know that Howard County Library System is such a resource to our community in general, award-winning library system. I had the honor of hosting this event last year for uh, Serata Virtual, mm -hmm. and that was a trip across Italy. And so to this year, we're going across the continent of Africa. What can we expect tonight? Oh, we're so excited. We've got two amazing and award-winning authors that you're going to, of course, speak with in just a moment. Uh, uh, we've got Tope Falaren, we've got Noviolet Roleo, and we are so excited to not only celebrate uh, the continent of Africa, but inform, which is what we do here at HCLS. Absolutely. Well, I want to thank you for your time tonight and thank all of you for joining us tonight. We have an exciting evening planned for everyone. So let's get into it. We've got real-time captions. They are available for this class. So just Make sure that you pick the CC option, the closed captioning button on your Zoom window. If you toggle them, you can toggle them on and off. That should help you. These captions are automatically generated by Zoom. So they may correct or they may contain some errors. So just bear with that and try to read through that. But if you're in need of any technical support, please message the host for assistance and you can get it that way as well. And during our conversation this evening, we invite you to submit your own questions that you have through chat. So just type that into the little chat box as well. Now I want to introduce you to our first author based in Washington, D.C. Tope Fularen is the executive director of the Institute of Policy Studies and the Lannan Visiting Lecturer in Creative Writing at Georgetown University. He has garnered many awards for his writing, including the prestigious Kane Prize for African Writing for his short story, The Miracle, published in Transition Magazine. Tope also serves as a board member of the Avalon Theater in Washington, DC, the vice president of the board of the Penn and Faulkner Foundation, and has and as a member of the President's Council of Pathfinder, he was educated at Morehouse College and at the University of Oxford, where he earned two master's degrees as a Rhodes Scholar. Welcome, Tope. It's so good to be here. Thanks so much for having me. So happy to have you here. Uh, you know, it sounds like you did not do a lot of school. <laughs> <laughs> Just a Rhodes Scholar we have, you know? <laughs> I just try to make my Nigerian parents happy, you know, like, I would you know? think that they should be. <laughs> 
<laughs> so we are really excited to talk more in depth with you as well. I mean, this is going to be just an amazing night. And I know that our second author for the evening is an emerging and strong voice in literature, No Violet Ulawayo. I think I said that right. Yes, I want to make sure it's right. No, Violet Ulawayo is the author of the novels Glory and We Need New Names, a book which was recognized with the Hurston Wright Legacy Award, the Penn Hemingway Award, the LA Times Book Prize, Art Seidenbaum Award for First Fiction, the Etzelot Prize for Literature, the Fred Brown, L uh, or the Fred Brown Literary Award and the Betty Trask Award and the Barnes and Noble Discover Award, second place and the National Book Foundation Five Under Thirty Five Fiction Selection. Um, I make no apologies for stumbling because it's your fault for winning so many awards. You have so many awards for your work. We are really, I mean, just very, very impressive. On top of that, We Need New Names was also shortlisted for the International Literature Award the Man Booker Prize and the Guardian First Book Award. No Violet earned her MFA at Cornell University and has taught fiction writing at Cornell and Stanford Universities. She grew up in Uluwayo, uh, Uluwayo Zimbabwe and is currently writing a full time from wherever she chooses to be, I believe right now in Texas. Is that correct? Let's welcome No Violet. It's correct and thank you for having me. This is such a joy. Oh, it's such a pleasure. I mean, when I have two authors of this caliber with a list of awards, I know for you all, it's not about the awards, but the actual content of the book, but wow, to be recognized so much and in this way has to feel very, very good. Now, Violet, I wanna start with you. You have a very beautiful name and I sense that there might be a story behind it. Yes, absolutely. Um, Violet is my mother's name who passed when I was a baby, and I decided to use her name in honor of her memory. The N-O in my language means with or mother of. And of course, Bulawayo is my hometown. I was stuck in the US for 13 years before I was able to go back home. So it was my way of staying connected to the, to the homeland. That is a beautiful backstory. And I know many people have an experience like that when they come to the States and then they can't go back right away. My father's from Ethiopia, the same thing. You did not go back for 17 years and now we can't get him to stay. He goes back every year. Um, so we, we hear these stories. So what a beautiful name and way to honor your mother and your homeland um, in all of your work, everything that you do. Um, and a little birdie told me that you two know each other already our two authors, where did your paths cross? And can you share about that? Let's see, I think we met in London back in 2013. I was in London for the Kane Prize and I was a very- the, he had, <laughs> Yeah, he, he had gone there to win the Kane Prize. Um. <laughs> so before I knew that was happen, happening, uh, Nova, I, I met her, I'd read her work obviously, um, but it was such a joy to meet her. She has an incredible sense of humor so bright um and she provided me with a lot of especially like in the moments after i won which it's an incredible kind of whirlwind when you win i'd never been in that kind of setting before and so you know they kind of uh, you know they wait until the very end of the night to announce who won then they announce my name i go up you know i give a little speech i for the life of me can't remember what i said hopefully it was you know somewhat coherent um get off the stage you know violet was there to kind of support me through the process of like you know winning because she had she won a few years before. And so she was, you know, kind of a, a practice winner by that point. Uh, so it was great to kind of interact with her there. And we've had the great opportunity to interact since then, so. Absolutely. And of course he handled his, his win very, very well. He was poised and ready. I think our, our nickname for, for Jope was Barack Obama, actually. <laughs> I love it. Well, yeah, he, he is going to be a president one day, but it, it was such a joy to be with him and, uh, and his group. And of course, we also met in uh, Kenya, right? Yeah. Uh, we were in Zambia. We oh, were Zambia. Was it Zambia? Maybe, somebody, maybe Nigeria as well. See? <laughs> oh, I, I know. Yeah. 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 And apparently, travel partners accidentally as well, if you're just <laughs> meeting up exactly. across the globe. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> well, it looks like we have several questions that are already starting to come in. They started coming in during our introduction. So I want to make sure that we jump right in and the 
first question I have is for you, Tope. In your debut novel, A Particular Kind of Black Man, you write about a Nigerian family living in Utah and their uneasy assimilation into American life. In your writing and elsewhere, you often speak to the concept of identity construction. So can you explain a little bit more to us what that means for you? Yeah, sure. Um, I guess when I was growing up, I the thing I struggled with most was that I, I just didn't know who I was. And I noticed that the people around me seemed to have this kind of innate sense of who they were meant to be. Like they just were walking around the world. There was no question. Whereas I was constantly questioning, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to speak? How am I supposed to interact with people? And my, my father would often tell me, so he'd say, you're a Nigerian, that's all you need to know. And I know, I, and, I, and I accepted that, but it didn't feel quite right. You know, of course, I'm proud of my Nigerian heritage. It's a core part of who I am. But, you know, I was born and raised in this country. I had a different set of experiences and tastes than my parents had. So I wasn't quite sure how to reconcile that. And then a number of people said, oh, you're an African-American. That's, that's who you are. And I love the African-American tradition. I am a part of that, obviously, because... I am literally an African-American since I was born and raised in this country, but uh, there were certain things about the culture that I didn't understand because I didn't grow up in that tradition. And so, you know, I had a kind of crisis when I went to grad school. You know, I, I'd done everything I was supposed to do academically. I find myself in this wonderful place at Oxford, uh, which was difficult in its own ways, but wonderful because I was able to kind of step outside of the, the kind of desperate academic rat race and I'd been on for quite some time. And it was the first time that I was, you know, kind of in a place of calm and and I was able to ask myself a number of questions that I hadn't really asked myself before. Something as basic as, you know, what makes me smile? I didn't know what made, or what makes me cry, those kinds of questions. And so I spent a lot of time like interrogating myself. And, and then after a couple of months of this process, I, I thought, well, you know, the great thing about being here is that I can decide who I am. And I'd never thought of it that way before. I'd always thought, you know, I have, I've inherited something and I need to kind of continue that tradition. And being in England was the first time where I said to myself, I can actually sort of take parts of this culture, parts of that culture, um, because that feels more aligned with who I actually am. And so that's when I, I started thinking about like the idea of identity construction. And of course, that idea is a core part of my book as well. I smile because these are conversations that I've had with many of my friends as well as being first generation. My mother is from Alabama. My dad is from Ethiopia. So there was a lot of identity construction, especially when uh, your dad is trying to raise you as if you're still an Addis, um, yeah. but you are not. Yeah. So I identify very closely with what it is that you're, you're speaking of. I want to thank you for sharing that. And our, our next question is for No Violet. Glory, of course, is an exhilarating novel about the fall of an oppressive regime and the chaos and opportunity that rise in its wake. Its theme seems to resonate with resistance movements across the world challenging different forms of oppression. To what extent did Orwell's Animal Farm inform your novel, Glory, and what made you decide to write your very human characters as animals? Um, George Orwell is an obvious uh inspiration because the stories kind of uh, mirror each other in so far as both being stories of revolutions that get uh, that get betrayed and it's quite interesting that at some point when I was working on the book animal farm started showing up in in our in the, in the uh, social media conversations among Zimbabweans it could be as simple as people just referring to Zimbabwe as an animal farm or assigning animal avatars to our, to our leaders. And of course, I began thinking, hmm, there is something there that I can maybe use. And um, marrying that thread to my grandmother's animal stories that were very much the background of my childhood. I grew up before TV. I'm sure uh, families who could afford to were watching TV, but in my family, there was no TV. I think my dad was, you know, had better things to do instead of <laughs> buying his, his children a TV. So what that meant is that I, I really grew up on, on stories. My grandmother's being uh, quite, quite, um, quite central to my childhood. And uh, I did not know back then that I was being prepared to write a story like Glory, a story that would allow me to reach to my reach back to my uh, to my roots and sort of 
revisit the past sort of resurrect my grandmother who's now led in her storytelling and her technologies and create something new and, and fresh and, and, and modern. But I'll also say that Glory was inspired by a happening story, you know, uh, the story of the fall of Robert Mugabe. So I very quickly ran into a problem where I would be writing and the political players would be living their lives and shaping events in a way that started to outpace my own writing. So using animal characters actually allowed me to own the story, uh, take ownership, allow it to go places I, I wanted it to go, uh, things that would not have otherwise been possible with human characters with sticking to the story as it was unfolding. So it, it, I mean, in short, it gave me so much, so much freedom to do all sorts of things um, at an artistic level so clever and it resonates with so many people and even when people can't relate they appreciate um, what it is that you've told through this story very very powerful tope i want to um, switch to you your next question um, midway through the book there's a remarkable shift in the tone of the book and tunde akinola the protagonist in your book says that i've only just realized that i was studying a particular kind of black man what does he mean by that yeah, um, I think <laughs> it's always funny to talk about what your characters mean. <laughs> I, don't want to the I think my character, no, um, yeah, I think for me, uh, I was thinking a lot about the question that you asked me before around identity construction. And my father definitely, as he was raising us, my siblings um, and me, had a Black person in mind. Um, I know it's probably a verboten to mention this person, but I shall anyway, because it's part of my history, um, when I was young, my dad, he was, the one thing that he did was that he kind of programmed my siblings and me. Like, and so he had in mind, I mean, we had, when we get, got home from school, he he pasted a schedule on the refrigerator and a schedule of things that we had to do. So like from 3.30 to, to four, we were supposed to rest from four to 4.30, clean the house, 4.30 to five, do handwriting exercises, five, you know, and so on and so forth. And we had a bit of time every day, usually about 30 minutes, possibly sometimes an hour to watch TV. And my dad had recorded a bunch of shows that he wanted to watch. So he had actually watched the shows beforehand, had determined whether they were relevant or not, or we could gain something from them. And then he would play these, these shows for us. And one show that my dad loved was a show called I Spy, which aired in the 60s. It starred Robert Culp and Bill Cosby. And the thing about the show was that Bill Cosby was a Rhodes Scholar, a tennis player, he was the brains of the operation. Apparently my dad had watched this show in Nigeria and his mind had been blown by the fact that the black person in a black white partnership was the smart one. And so, you know, we watched that show. We watched a bunch of shows on PBS. My dad was constantly saying, you know, if he saw somebody say, you should be that way. And so he had this idea of the kind of men he wanted us to be, but there wasn't a lot of, there wasn't a lot of conversation about who we were internally, what was happening inside of a, the emotions and everything else that were roiling within us. Um, and so I wanted to kind of describe that crisis in my book. When you have done a good job or a great job even of constructing a persona that satisfies everyone else, but the expense of who you might be internally. And I discovered again, uh, when I was in grad school that I had done a really good job of constructing a persona that people liked, it seemed, that garnered me attention and even praise, but I didn't have the first idea who I actually was. And I saw I had this kind of crisis. Um, and my dad had given me these skills to kind of, you know, succeed in the world. Again, you know, he, he made us do handwriting practice. He made us do public speaking practice. He did all kinds of things. And so we were prepared um, and he had this vision, but I just, I didn't know who I was. And so I thought, what, who are you as an individual if you are able to present and be, you know, sort of successful in the public, but you don't know what's happening inside? And is that a kind of setup for an even bigger crisis down the line? Um, and then also just briefly to talk about the book and, and where that happens in the book. One thing that I encountered a lot when I was reading, uh, and, I, and I do write criticism as well, is that there's an expectation that I think the publishing world has for works by black folks to be accessible in a way. You know, this notion that, okay, like tell us a story in a way that we can receive it because we just wanna know, there's a kind of anthropological interest sometimes in the work that we create. And I wanted to upset that a little bit. I thought I can't tell an honest story about my trajectory if I don't complicate the narrative a little bit because my story 
does not proceed from A to Z without hiccups and without sort of uh, all kinds of weird things that happen. And so I thought, and I read a bunch of literature that does all kinds of interesting things. And I, I've noticed that that expectation doesn't seem to exist for other writers. So I wanted to kind of take on the responsibility of rendering my journey. And I know other people have had a similar journey. I wanted to render that as accurately as I could. Before we move on to our next, first of all, thank you. And before we move on to our next question, I just wanna make sure that we take a moment right now to thank our sponsors and remind you, everyone watching, that our goal for this evening is to raise funding for Howard County Library System. Proceeds from this evening's event will benefit the creation of a welcoming and inviting teen space actually several spaces in the library, six different branches. So please join us in making a very real difference for teens in our community. Look in the chat for a link to participate. Good evening, everyone. I'm Julia Crawford with Grimm and Parker Architects. Grimm and Parker Architects is honored to be a sponsor of this year's Evening in the Stacks Across Africa. We have had the pleasure of working with Howard County Library System for over 30 years. From the design of the East Columbia branch in the 1990s to the design of the Charles E. Miller branch and the most recent design of the Elk Ridge branch and Do-It-Yourself Education Center. We wish Howard County Library System continued excellence and success in their mission to deliver accessible and public education for all. again to our sponsors. Let me make sure I'm not muted. There we go. All right. <laughs> Coming out of video, you never know. We want to thank all of our sponsors for supporting such an important initiative. And we want to return to our panel. Um, this question is for you, know Violet, so get ready. Religion is greatly or greatly affects the course of events and colors the perceptions in the real world and in your novel as well. Can you speak to that a little bit more? I think you're muted now. We're muting each other. Here we go. Can you, uh, there you go. Yes, absolutely. Um, before I answer the question, I'll tell a very quick, quick story. I'm a storyteller after okay. all. So I, I, I was in Zimbabwe after the house of Robert Mugabe. I think it was after 2018. And I gave a ride to a police officer. For some reason, I just like giving members of our security forces rights 
so I can talk to them and conduct informal interviews for my work. But anyway, of course, I had to talk about the political situation. I think at the time things were going, were starting to change to, in a way that uh, spoke to the fact that the ouster of Robert Mugabe was not going to uh, bring the change that we had hoped for. And uh, anyway, the, the police officer, nice guy, uh, said, you know what, I think people should leave politics alone to the politicians and just go to church, you know? And it was, it was not a surprise. Um, in fact, I think he best captured life as I see it being lived in Zimbabwe, that most people prefer to just go to church versus participate in the uh, in the political process and of course i am interested in how religion can be misused to keep people oppressed and how people can actually become participants in their own subjugation by becoming fine with the kind of narrative that says they should just concentrate on their spiritual lives and leave the political life to the politician, to the politicians. And there's a verse that I quote quite a bit in glory. Um, somehow the, the exact verse is, 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 run, is escaping me right now, but it says something like, you know, the governing authorities are chosen by God and people should sort of follow um, who God has chosen. So. Glory uh, as a project is kind of resisting that idea. And because part of my creative work and part of my challenge as a writer is to sort of imagine and dream into being, at least on paper, the kind of words that I want to see, I carry the animal denizens of Shijada to a space where they actually wake up from their slumber and decide that they are done with a kind of religion that helps in their oppression. They decide that they want a religion that will free them, a religion that will transform their lives. Um, they want to experience paradise while they are alive instead you know, of in the afterlife. And what is interesting is that once they make their switch, actually, uh, once they make that switch, actually their res resistance becomes clearer, becomes robust. And in the end, they actually end up seeing the data that they want, to, um, they want to see. At the same time, alongside Christianity, there is the indigenous religion, which as we all know, um, unfortunately as formerly colonized peoples, our traditional religions were, were challenged and cast aside by the coming of Christianity. But I'm interested in, 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 in us kind of reaching back to those religions and seeing how they can serve us today when this other religion is seemingly trying to get us to where we need to be. And in the novel, um, the indigenous, it is the indigenous religion that is really responsible for keeping people connected to the past, to the past history it is the indigenous religion that is responsible for community building in, in very meaningful and politicized ways. So I'm really advocating for, for a balance, yeah. for people to know their true religions, what has been lost. Um, is there something in that past, in that traumatic past that we can excavate as we try to figure out the way forward? Absolutely, and reaching back how much it puts our present into context too, Absolutely. the way that you write. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to take a three minute intermission right now. So make sure that as you're watching, you, you have three minutes now to take care of any needs that you have, get some water, walk around, do whatever you need to do, but rejoin us shortly for more with our authors. Thank you.
take a look at the beginning of block 36, please, period. I feel like there's something missing. All right, hopefully you had enough time to do what you needed to do. Welcome back. During that break, we put up a poll and once everyone has had a chance to complete it, we will share the poll results. Uh, but I can tell you the correct answer for both questions. Let's see. All right, it's C. And it looks like many of you have gotten that right. So Tope and No Violet, do you have anything else to add about those correct an answers? Can you see them in your chat there? Yeah, surprised <laughs> that people got it, but I, I guess it's such a specific response that I love Star Trek. So, you know, I wasn't gonna lose that. <laughs> so I did. <laughs> Were you surprised too, No Violet? Or did you, you think that you had more faith in our viewers? <laughs> oh, I think you're muted. Just press unmute quickly. Oh, I, I, I had more faith in your in your viewers actually. Oh, look at this. Look at, look at, look at the setup. <laughs> I love all of you. Love you. <laughs> well, we hope that you are all enjoying our conversation. Even you, Tope, we're just teasing with you. Um, with Tope and No Violet, please remember to put any questions that you have in chat. Topia and Violet, the next question is for both of you. Um, I'd like you to talk about the centrality of storytelling within different generations of family members, as well as the use of different kinds of storytelling that you both use in your writing. Was there one that you particularly enjoyed or maybe even struggled with? Um, I can start with you, Topia, if you want. Sure. Um, I think... No, Violet said something uh, a couple minutes ago that really resonated with me, which is trying you know, this kind of idea that we we need to remember what came before, what came the great came before the great interruption of colonialism, 
And uh, it's something I spent a lot of time thinking about as well. And uh, when I was growing up, my mother used to tell me a, a bunch of stories featuring animals, doing all kinds of things. It was a core part of my childhood. Um, and I actually integrated one of those stories. One story was a series of stories about a turtle who's always up to no good, who's always causing trouble, who's always you know, doing things that he's not supposed to be doing. Um, and I embedded that story into my book. It start, there's a one version of it at the beginning and then the book concludes with my version of the turtle story um, and it ends in a different way. And for me, it was a kind of Easter egg in my book. And I assumed that not many people would catch what I was saying. And I was at a conference a few weeks ago and uh, a white person from Yale who was studying Yoruba came up to me and said, oh yeah, I know what you're doing with that. And so it was like, really, yeah, most of all the people in the world who would like catch what I was doing, that, that was incredibly meaningful that somebody had spent the time learning about my culture and why it's important to me. But I, I think um, in my book, I tried my best to kind of integrate all the kinds of stories that I grew up with. I'm a science fiction fanatic, as I've already alluded to. And so there's, you know, science fiction components in my book. I love literary fiction, of course. And so spent years of my life studying craft and thinking about literary fiction. That's part of it. I love, you know, sort of all kinds of stuff. And, and so I, I love theater and plays. And so there's a stretch of, you know, sort of uh, a kind of theater, a play, a kind of playwriting stuff that happens in my, in my book as well. And so um, the, the one thing I'll say to conclude is that I think that I, and I, and I think I suspect no violence in a similar position. We are the inheritors of, of all kinds of traditions, right? And I, the one thing that I try to do in my work is to not sort of, you know, isolate one thing at the expense of another. I think I've arrived at a place in life where I'm incredibly glad that I've, you know, watched, you know, American television and listened to Nigerian stories and listened to Nigerian music growing up almost exclusively, but also listened to when I, my parents weren't listening, listened to hip hop and R&B. And I wanted all of that to be a part of the story that I, I told to the world. I love that. And No Violet, how was it for you writing storytelling from multiple generations as well? Actually, I agree with Mr. Pe that we are yeah. we are both um, influenced by all different kinds of uh, traditions, and it's such a, a, a gift and such a beautiful space to be in, because it can only enhance our our work. Now, I I did formally study creative writing. I did an MFA um, at Cornell. I had a beautiful experience, but I. What I realized at the time I was studying is that uh, the U.S. assumes that the extent of literature is 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 through books, the written word. You know, uh, somebody would be like, "So what are your influences?" And they expect you, expect you to talk about the obvious. But for some of us, even before books, there were stories. There were storytellers who were real and alive. And I think what for me, what that did for me was to give me the idea that writing was a living thing because I just sit and watch maybe my dad or my grandfather, uh, grandmother actually birth a story through their mouths. So for me as a kid, I was like, okay, so your language has to be alive. You know, I, I couldn't imagine a story being, being read um, at the time. And of course, around me, we were raised by women who mostly stayed at home in the neighborhoods. So they were always gossiping, telling stories. And thus began my informal education about how to tell a story, language, dialogue, character, etc, etc. You know, the I'm sorry, continue. No, no, go ahead. I was just saying this conversation is reminding me of even growing up because I remember my dad giving me all of these books and then at night, me asking him, hey, read me a story. He says, I could read you a story. I could tell you a story. Ah. And so he would tell me these stories that I'm sure his, his mother, my grandmother, would tell him, you know, characters about a snake or a lion or something. But they were always, um, especially as a child, they, they make you feel a part of a story because it's not you're reading a story, you're delivering a story. It, it's, it paints a picture in your head. So as you're saying this, I'm recalling these nights that were so many, what, 30 years removed, actually longer, we're not gonna age myself, but you, you know what I mean? It, it takes you back to those moments. Um, 
Tope, I know for you also, music was an underlying theme to Tunde's story from the rhythms of Juju to gospel, to the Beatles, to Boys and Men. What role did music play in your life and who did you enjoy listening to? You sort of touched on it a little yeah. bit. You were listening to a lot of Nigerian music and then, but more beyond that as well. Yeah, I think the big moment in my life is when uh, my family moved from Utah to Texas because in Utah, I was born in Utah and lived there for 13 years. And um, my dad was able to achieve this grand dream of kind of separating us from, you know, the culture and things that were happening and, you know, inculcating us with his idea of the way we ought to be in the world. And, and so I, you know, lived this very disciplined life away from the kind of culture that was flowering around me at that point. Um, and so then we moved to Texas and it was impossible to keep that stuff at bay because Utah is a very, um, you know, Mormonism dominates that there's a sense, a, a sense of propriety in the way you're supposed to kind of carry yourself in the world. And then, you know, Texas was a very diverse place and we moved uh, just very close to Dallas. And, um, and one of the first things I did when we, we moved there was I started listening to the radio and my dad had already said, you know, you can't listen to popular music. You can only listen to gospel music. And so I'm surreptitiously listening to a radio like under the covers after <laughs> I hear my dad's snores rattling down the hallway. Exactly. And I had this moment, this is like 1995, when I heard um, the Fugees for the first time, I heard Killing Me Softly. And I think it was, it was an incredibly important moment because one, I was so touched by that song and I couldn't realize, I couldn't explain what was happening, but something shifted inside of me. And I think it was the first time that I, I came to understand the power of art. Um, and for, so I wanted to talk about that because I think for a lot of people, like music is the most accessible art form. Not everyone has a chance to kind of walk waltz into a gallery and, you know, sort of look at paintings on the wall or sometimes even books can be out of, you know, um, can't, aren't accessible to people. So the one experience that people have, you know, can be the stories that your parents tell you. If you emerge from a context similar to me or No Violet, or music, which is, you know, about art as well. It's, it's really about the visceral act of connection. Um, and so I, I became obsessed with music. I became obsessed with figuring out who sang and who produced the record, um, who was in the room in the studio, like working on a track. I, you know, memorized every lyric to All Eyes on Me by Tupac Shakur, you know, much to my father's chagrin, mm -hmm. and was listening to a lot of Biggie and stuff. And like that really, had a, a really major impact on my development as a human being, my development as an artist, because I began to see the craft that was at play. To my father, rap was just a bunch of people like cursing at each other and he had no appreciation for it at all. But because of my sort of self kind of, my, my, my immersion in that art form, I saw, I began to appreciate what these artists were doing. And I think in the end, I was beginning to shape my own idea of how I would become an artist later on. Now, Violet, in a guest post for Barnes & Noble, you wrote on November 14th, 1917, or 1917, 2017, rather, I woke up to the improbable news of the ouster of Robert G. Mugabe, Zimbabwe's then president by military. Dear reader, I simply lost my shit. <laughs> Can you elaborate on your feelings and how it inspired you to write glory on that, it's starting from that day? You're muted again, so just. Um, that was such a complicated day, a day I will probably not forget anytime soon because of, of, of the weight of it and um, the feelings, just processing the feelings. I had accepted the fact that Robert Mugabe was simply going to die in office. Mm -hmm. Um, he had always been reminding this throughout his reign, you know, he had this favorite quote where he'd say, only God who put me here will remove me, I'm paraphrasing. So just waking up to news of a coup and the fact that his the realization that he had actually met his end was such a, was such a shock. Um, so there was the initial numbness, the disbelief of could that be happening? And I think uh, a lot of us called each other just to confirm that it was indeed true. And once that was confirmed, there was the, there was the joy, the happiness. And it was a sick kind of happiness because we were enjoying 
his misery, enjoying the fact that this source of our suffering had dug his own grave. Mm -hmm. It was not a time for sympathizing with him um, in as much as he may have needed our our sympathy. Mm. And then at the same time, there was also the fear, the uncertainty that, okay, what is going to happen after this after this chapter the not knowing yeah. um, there was also the hope that even as it was a complicated moment even as we knew that the guy who was taking over was part and parcel of Robert Mugabe he would somehow move with us in the right direction turn a corner of course we know now that it was very very naive of us to think to think that so there were all these, these complicated emotions. And I remember I had a friend of mine visiting from Zimbabwe and there were moments where she would actually break down and cry mm -hmm. because she was also um, processing her own feelings. I remember reading on social media people who were actually angry over the fact that Mugabe had left office the way you know he did and he was not going to be held accountable for for the, for, for the many things that um, he needed to be held accountable for. So it, it really was such a complicated moment with so much to unpack that ended up taking about three and a half years in glory. But I knew from the get-go that it was a story that I needed to engage with because, you know, it's, it's not a story that I was prepared for. Absolutely, so many layers and so many emotions um, stemming from that day and then moving forward. Um, Tope, in 2013, you became the first writer based outside of Africa to win the prestigious Kane Prize, which you won for your short story, Miracle. What inspired you to write Miracle? Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> so Miracle was um, inspired by, uh, I mentioned before my move to Texas when I was 13. Um, and I came to understand that one of the reasons that my parents moved to Texas was simply because they missed Nigerians. And there's a large community of Nigerians in the Dallas area, an even larger community in Houston. Um, and so for the first time, I was around a lot of Nigerians. And there were so many Nigerians that there was a Nigerian church and Nigerian grocery store. And it was a kind of little Nigerian community um, in, in where, where I, I lived. And so had this experience of going to a Nigerian church for the first time. And it was such an intense experience. I'd never been in a situation like that before ever. And, um, and to kind of see how, uh, how seriously everyone took it, how desperately people prayed, you know, how, you, how loud they were and how jovial they were. All of that was just such an incredibly sort of powerful experience for me. And so I wanted to write about you know, of course, if you're writing a story, you need something to happen. And so I kind of come up with a plot, a very, and the plot of my story is about a, a boy who um, has glasses and there's a visiting prophet from Nigeria who claims he can heal him. And so, uh, you know, the plot is around whether that happens or not. But I, I just wanted to, my objective with telling the story was to kind of capture this feeling of, um, being in a new place and encountering new things. And I also want to tell a story about what it means to be accountable for a community. Um, because the story, I, I write the story in first person plural and, and we, in the we sort of uh, point of view. And so at the beginning of the story, it's really a story about the community that wants miracles that, you know, is, is suffering and is desperate. Um, and then there's a boy who's kind of pulled out of that we, and he becomes accountable for you know, kind of all the dreams of the community. If the miracle doesn't happen, they might lose faith and faith is the only thing that's keeping them afloat in America. And so he bears the responsibility of ensuring that they, they retain that faith, even, even in really difficult circumstances. Um, and so that's the story. And, you know, I'm just so glad that I was able to, you know, that I was fortunate enough to be shortlisted for the Kane Prize. I didn't actually know I was eligible until a writer who's actually in this area, a man named Helan Habila, um, you know, uh, suggested that I, I submit my story for the prize. And, and then uh, I was lucky enough to be shortlisted. And uh, when I was at Oxford, I spent most, I, I, my goal at Oxford was to read through the Heinemann African Writers Series. And so I, I can't say that I finished, but I read a bunch of books 
in that series. And they were uh, incredibly important to me. I learned so much about, I, I didn't know there was this grand African writing tradition before I, I turned 22 and reading those books uh, was really key for me. And so to kind of, in a way, be a part of that tradition, kind of, you know, kind of, what became very meaningful to me. Now, Violet, this next question is for you. And we need new names. Destiny provides another, perhaps fresher perspective on Jidada when she decides to return. Do you think that her experiences are usual for expats who return home? Is it hard to leave? And is it harder or hard to go back? Um, I, I think every experience is, is individual. For some people, um, it's quite, it's quite easy to live. Some people leave because they just want to experience a new place, a different space, and they have the means to do so. For some, like Destiny, she leaves because she's forced to. She's, she's violated in the country that she, um, that she calls home. And her return is not a willful return. She returns because the shelter that she sought outside of the borders of Jidada tends to be no shelter. And I think I really was writing uh, while sitting with the tragic uh, migrant stories that we were seeing all over the world, really, the, 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 the anti-migrant, the anti-immigrant sentiment that was, you know, dominating the news. And so I decided to make destiny part of, uh, part of those rejected uh, people who fail to find um, refuge and has to go back to a broken country that broke her. Her experience then becomes one of confronting her past trauma, which turns out to be connected, unknown to her at the time, to her mother's trauma, which also turns out to be connected to a larger uh, national trauma that unfolds, especially toward, toward the end of the book. So I, I wouldn't say that experience is representative. Some people return home to more beautiful stories, but I was interested in the particular stories of people who return uh, to face, you know, to, to face traumas, to face difficult realities, um, but still, manage to make something out of those out of those complicated um, complicated moments. What I hear from both of you is that you stress the individual in the midst of a collective culture um, that can sometimes be um, sometimes I don't want to say overbearing, but all all encompassing when it's yeah. uh, your food, your language, your religion. Um, we don't always take the moment to think about ourselves, process our feelings, process um, things that are positive or negative about returning home or raising your children in the diaspora. So to hear these conversations and to be able to read them now, uh, when I was coming up, there were not necessarily books that were talking about these experiences, experiences that I myself and other friends that I have that are first generation, not just African, but first generation, from all over, um, there are a lot of parallels that I'm hearing in, in these conversations, which, um, which we appreciate you putting into literary form. Um, we've got some more questions for you. You guys are both doing a very good job. I'm throwing a lot of questions at you, um, but I'm sure you're used to it. This one actually comes from Robin, and this question is directed for you, Tope. We're gonna switch hats a little bit. You mentioned it before. Which is your favorite Star Trek? <laughs> uh -huh. The next generation, um, Deep Space Nine is, is uh, you know, I think what I should say, it's a very kind of advanced and, and literary kind of Star Trek. But I, I um, when I, my biggest aspiration, I don't say this much, so <laughs> you guys must be special. When I was younger was, uh, I wanted to go to Starfleet Academy, which was, you know, like the place where like the brightest people in the galaxy went to learn how to like, you know, sort of ride starships and, or drive starships. and um, and there was this Starfleet Academy episode of The Next Generation that I just watched over and over and over again. Um, and in a way, you know, like going to Oxford was my version of that. You know, I just wanted, I was so desperate to, to kind of be in this space where I was around people from around 
either the world or the galaxy, whatever, which, whatever one I could do. And, uh, and so I think there's this kind of sense of joy and uh, ambition to the next generation that I really loved and really influenced me in all kinds of ways. I was just thinking if anyone could have done that, it would have been you. So if it, <laughs> that makes sense. And Robin wants you to know that she favors Deep Space Nine, but you know, she will allow okay. your, your pick to stay. Okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and um, we have another question actually for both of you, but no, Violet, I'll have you start. Christy wants to know if either of you had any input in designing your book jackets for your books. Um, absolutely, I, I did, but I'm, I'm very happy to say that um, the, the, the artist who designed the, what do you call the first thing, whatever you call it, actually um, took it upon herself to do so while I was still trying to figure out what the jacket was going to look like. So it, it really felt like a gift that she was already doing the work for me. Um, but I think where I, I had the most was with the colors. I don't remember the original colors, but I decided that we, we use the flag of, of Chitada, modeled after Zimbabwe, of course. So, yeah. And Pope, did you? Yeah, no, I love, I love art. It's one of my passions. And I was looking at uh, some art and I came across an image by a Zimbabwean artist his name, I will probably mispronounce it, but I think it's Imar Kamuzangarere. And I had never seen his work before, but the moment I saw the image, it was an image of a kind of outline of an obviously kind of black male face. I knew that was the cover of my book. And so I, I wrote my editor and I said, figure out a way to get this on the cover of my book. <laughs> Make it and I didn't hear back from Simon and Schuster for like three months. And then I just got an email and it was a cover featuring that image. And so I'm incredibly grateful to them for doing it. And, you know, I'd envisioned the book for a long time. So to see that vision come to life was very meaningful to me. So quickly, before we close, we have to ask you, what book is on your bedside table right now? What are you reading? Oh, gosh, I am reading um, Intimacies by Katie, was it Kitsuma? I forget her surname, but it's a book that came out last year that garnered a lot of attention. So I'm reading that book right now. Okay, and Novila, what about you? Oh, I'm sorry, you're muted. There you go. Uh, the Sex Lives of African Women by Nana Sekiyama. Um, I'm also it's a book that I'm rereading because I love it so much. I love the complexity with which she treats the misunderstood and often ignored subject of the rich lives, uh, the layered lives of, of, African, uh, of African women when it comes to sex and sexuality. Yeah. Both of you have been incredible to speak with tonight. I know I'm not the only one who feels like that. Our chat is blowing up with thank yous and, and more questions. We would keep you for hours if we could, but we just wanna thank you for your time. We encourage anyone who has not yet purchased their tickets for Saturday evening's live event to do so. Our live event will include a marketplace featuring clothing and accessories, authentic food, great music and entertainment. Please encourage your friends to buy their tickets before Saturday. Don't wait till the last minute, make sure you do that. If you would like to buy a copy of any of these books, we have put the link in the chat. And before we end, we also wanna give a special thank you to all the folks who worked so hard to help us raise these funds while having such a great time. It means a, it means a huge thank you to all of our sponsors specifically. We could not have done this evening on without that support. And so finally, to all of our guests as well, thank you for taking this evening to enjoy us in support or to join us in support of the Howard County Library System. Your continued support means so much, especially this year. And we look forward to seeing you all Saturday night at the East Columbia branch. Good night, everyone.
Thank you.